Swifty Scallywags, it's Prof Gene. In this lesson, we're going to learn one way that we can create mock data when using Swift data so that we can have some placeholder data when working with our Xcode previews. We'll also update our to-do list view so that we have rows that show dates and if a date reminder is set, and we'll use folders and groups to better organize our project. Don't mock this lesson, it's full of big learning. So Swift scholars, we're continuing in our to-do list app. If you're new here, welcome. You might want to start from earlier lessons in the playlist so you can see how we got here. But for everyone else, in this lesson, we're going to update the rows that show each line in our list in our to-do list view. But one thing that's frustrating is that when we're trying to code up screens that could potentially hold lots of data, is that in the preview, there isn't any data unless we add it. Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to show how we can create a preview property in a class that will hold mock data or dummy data that we'll only use in the previews. But this will give us something to work with when we're working with layouts in our Swift code. It'll make it easier to envision and modify some of the things that we want to code up. And before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to Mark Moykins of Big Mountain Studios. Mark has a great set of Swift and Swift UI books that he regularly updates. They're wonderfully laid out, easy to read, very visual. I've learned the latest techniques in Swift data previews from his book on Swift data mastery in Swift UI. And if you sign up for Mark's mailing list, he usually sends out when the books go on sale. Go get them. They're great resources. Now for us, we're going to start creating our property for our mock data in our class. And for us, that's our to-do class that's in our to-do Swift file, so head there. And while there are many ways to create mock data, the method that I'm going to be using is to create a static variable named preview that's part of our class. We could name it anything, but I think preview is a pretty good name. You'll see lots of developers use that. So in our example, this is part of our to-do class. And this preview variable will be a model container type. Now this preview model container will be different from the real model container that holds our actual data on our iOS device. This preview model container will only hold our mock data or our fake data that we use on the preview canvas. So it doesn't even show up in the simulator, it only shows up in the preview canvas when we code. Now this is a static property and we mentioned static properties in a prior lesson. So when you have a static property or function, you don't need to create an instance of that class. So no object is needed to refer to it. Instead you can just refer to the class name dot whatever the static property is. So in our case, we can say to do capital T capital D, that's the class name dot preview. Now this static variable also happens to be a computed property. That means it doesn't contain an assigned value after an equal sign. Instead, the value of this variable, the preview variable, is going to be based on whatever we put between curlies and then return. So since this is a type model container, inside the curlies we're going to create a model container. We're going to call this container, and it's based on the to-do class. And again, we're going to put this preview property, this static property, inside of that class. Now this container is also going to be stored in memory only. It's not permanently saved. And that also means that each time we restart our app, the mock data that you see in the preview will restart based on what's below. You are going to be able to make changes to this data as long as the preview is running, but if you restart the app, again, you're going to restart with whatever we put below. Then to put data inside of this model container that's going to be in memory, we're going to refer to its model context. It's called main context here. Now we're going to insert all of our mock data in this area below. Here we've got four lines for four different pieces of mock data that's going to be in our preview container. And after we've loaded up all of our data, we just return the container property, and that's what goes inside of this preview variable. Now to make it easier to understand how you can do this on your own, I've marked everything that needs to change in in this sort of neon green. So you also can call your model container that contains your mock data preview if you want, but you want to set it up inside whatever class you're using in your new app. In our case, it's to do. In any subsequent app, you want to make sure that you change this for whatever class you're using and whatever class you're creating preview data for. And then the specific data that you insert inside of that container is going to be different as well. You'll use your class initializer to put that data in. You don't necessarily have to limit your data to four items like we have here, but the basic setup is going to be the same for you. So let's code this up. Now I'm going to start by entering this new preview variable inside of our class. So for us, that's the to-do class, and we'll do this just before the close and curly. Now I'm eventually going to move this to an extension just to make this neater, but let's not distract from what we're doing now. We're creating a new static property. So just before the close and curly, we'll start with static var preview, the name of our variable, 
colon, and the type of value that preview is is model container. The capital M, capital C, again, that's our type, upper camel case. Then we'll open and close parentheses. And the parens mean that instead of assigning something to be equal to this variable, we're going to be calculating what's inside the variable based on whatever we put between the curlies. So because preview is a model container inside of the curlies, we're going to create and then at the end return a value of type model container. So we'll say let container, that's just the value that we're using internally as we calculate the model container, equal try exclamation point model container. Choose this first option with four and configurations. We've got to include try because this could possibly throw a value, but we'll just use try exclamation point. We'll assume this works. Now four wants the model, and that's just the name of the class where we're creating this property. So for us, that's going to be to do, capital T, capital D, but we always put dot self after that. Then tab over to configurations, and you can start to type model configuration, and the option we want is the one with the is stored in memory only property, and we're going to pass in the variable true for that. Model container created. Now this is a computed property preview of type model container, so we've got to return that container that we just created. So I'll put in return container down here. That'll stop any error from popping up. But between creating the container and returning the container, we want to fill it up with data. And this is how we do that. We'll say container dot. And in this case, we follow it with main context. That's the model context for this container. Then we want to dot insert and select the option with model. And inside this model area is where we create an object of the model where this preview sits. And we'll have one of these lines for each element of data we want to create. So for us, we're going to type in to do, capital T, capital D. And we'll select this option down here with all of the initializer values from item through is completed. Those aren't showing up automatically, so I'm going to type the first three characters of each of the values until all of the items are selected. Item reminder is on, due date notes, and is completed. Then press return. And you can put in whatever values you want here. I'm going to say the item is create Swift data lessons, tab over, reminder is on, it'll be true. The due date will be capital D date dot now plus 60 times 60 times 24. The note will be just now with iOS 16 and Xcode 18. And then tab over for is completed as false. Then I'll highlight this entire line and copy it, and oh, I'm getting an error here. That's right. If you ever get a message in Xcode that says main actor isolated property cannot be referenced from the non-isolated context, this is not very friendly. Not to get too deeply in the weeds here, but it is possible to run different pieces of code on what are called different threads. They're almost like different lanes in the highway, and the thread that deals with anything that shows up in the user interface is the main thread. So we need to make sure that our mock data is also going to be on the main thread since it's going to show data that's impacting the user interface. So to get this error to go away, and anytime you see an error like this, we're just going to head to the top of our class and just above where we have at model, we'll say at main actor, capital M, capital A, error goes away. Then back down where our mock data is, let's create more data. So I'm going to paste in the line that I just created below, but I'll change it. And you can change this any way you'd like. For my item, I'm going to put in Macedonian Educators Talk because I have to give a talk to Macedonian Educators this week. Actually, I made a mistake. They're Montenegrin Educators. They're not Macedonian. So sorry about that, folks. Don't mean to be a chauvinist American. I'll change the due date here to 44 at the end. And the note is they want to learn about entrepreneurship. Then down below, I'll paste another copy and modify this data. This third item will be post flyers for Swift and Santiago. We'll make that three days later, so I'll put 72 at the end here. The note is this is going to be held at UAH in Chile. I'm going to be teaching in Chile next summer. I love teaching abroad in fun places if you want to hire me to teach at your uni during the summer, although that'll be at the winter Chilean time. Shoot me a message. We can talk. And then let's paste in one more item. Prepare old iPhone for my daughter Lily, and that's going to be in 12 hours. She gets my old pro, and we're looking good. So when we return the container, even though this was created as a let constant inside, this initial data will go into the preview variable, and we are going to be able to change that in the preview. Now, it would be fine to leave this the way it is, but you'll see many developers break out code that contains static properties or functions in their own extension. So I'll do that right now just to show you how you do that. If you come across this in other examples, I'm going to highlight this entire static var property, cut it out with a command X. Then below the closing curly for to do, I'm going to say extension to do capital T capital D open and close curlies, and I'm going to paste in that static preview variable that I just cut out. Beauty! Now to use this in our preview, it's super simple, my friends. Let's head back to our to-do list view. 
and I'll adjust my canvas and let's head down to the preview provider and then down below here where we set up our to-do list view with our dot model container property we're gonna get rid of the four in memory parameters that we have inside this and instead we'll just get the static property of our class by saying to do capital T capital D dot preview and if you wait a second the data will show up in the preview canvas fantastic now every once in a while you'll notice the data jump around on your screen we'll talk about sorting this data in a future lesson but you can see we can edit any of the properties in here in our preview data we can even click on data and have that passed over to other views edit it and come back and so now that we've got some mock data to work with let's modify our view and I'd like things to look like this I want to put a line below our checkbox and our to do item name that contains the date of the to do item and a little calendar icon that indicates if a reminder has been set this is what it's going to look like and the current checkbox and to do item are in their own H stack so I want to put another H stack below this H stack and I'm going to do that by embedding the H stack with the checkbox and the item name inside of a V stack so to get this, I'm going to two finger click or right click on the H stack here and select embed in V stack. Then let me code fold the first H stack and below the font modifier for that H stack, I'm going to enter a new H stack and in between its curlies, I'm going to enter our due date by saying text and in parentheses pass in to do dot due date. And I'm going to use the dot formatted method, select the one with the date and time options and code completion tells me that this generates a locale aware string representation of date using the specified date and time formatted style. We see this returns a string and that's exactly what we need to go into a text view. So select this. The date's going to be dot abbreviated. The time's going to be dot shortened. Those dates look formatted nicely. I'll gray them out a little bit by saying dot foreground style and passing in dot secondary or secondary color. We didn't create a dot secondary color. This is just the default one in iOS, but I think that looks nice. Now I'd like things in our V stack to be aligned left. So in our V stack up here, just before the opening curly, I'm going to add parentheses and enter the alignment parameter and specify dot leading. Dates are to the left, nice. Then in my lower H stack, just below my text with the to-do due date in there, I'm gonna say if, and predictive code completion is not guessing properly here, I wanna say to do dot reminder is on, open close curlies, and if this is true, I wanna show the image with the system name calendar dot badge dot clock. And let's riz that icon up a little bit by saying dot symbol rendering mode, passing in dot multicolor, and look at that, Swifters. We've got a nice second row with more data on each individual to-do list item and that was really easy to set up in our code because we've got our mock data now another thing to pay attention to as mentioned is if you make any changes to your data then restarting your app by pressing on the live preview button will forget any of those changes because the app restarts and recreates the preview data as was specified in code so there's no persistence of any preview data changes but there is of course for anything in the simulator or in your app for example, I mentioned that I'm talking to Montenegrins, not Macedonians. Again, sorry, folks. So I can change this in the preview, but if I press live in the preview data, the mock data before the change is reloaded. So why don't we open up the to-do class and change this. But while I've got the project navigator pane open, let's talk about organizing our files. So Apple made a change from a previous update of Xcode. It used to be possible to drag files and folders around in the project navigator pane. Not anymore. In fact, many developers don't like the new organization that's shown on the left. It's alphabetical, but that's not necessarily intuitive. For example, I like the old way where the app file was at the top of my folder. I can't drag this up. That's because the folders that Xcode offers now don't allow any reordering of files, but you can convert any folders to groups and create new groups. Those groups look just like a folder, but they can be reordered. So I'm gonna right click on our to-do list folder up here, and I can select convert to group from my pop-up menu. And once this is done, look at this. I can drag my app file as the first file in this folder it stays put I want my preview content down below since we're not really using this I can drag my assets catalog just below my code files maybe put my info up top although this used to be an appeal list file which was down below again you can organize your code files in any way you'd like now another thing developers often like to do is to organize code in subfolders or subgroups so for example I might want to put both of my views in a views group which is just like a folder but I can reorder it so I'm gonna click on to do list view and command click on detail view then right click and I'm gonna select 
to new group from selection. Both views are now nested inside this folder, which is more accurately a group. I'm going to name it views. And since my to-do list view appears in my app before my detail view does, I want to have that as the first item in my folder. So I can just click, drag, reorder. I can do that in a group. I can't do that with an Xcode folder. If I right click and select new group without saying do it from a selection, it just creates a new group style folder. So I'm going to call this new group models and I'm going to drag my to-do model into this group folder. And if I want to drag my entire models group folder above my views, I can do that as well. Again, no formal way to organize your code, but hopefully this gives you some ideas that you can use as your projects become larger. When you work with an established software firm, they'll probably have some kind of organization and naming conventions that they want you to follow. So Swifter, once again, we've had big learning. We learned to use mock data. Hopefully you now know how to set that up in your own apps that use Swift data. And once we set up our own mock data, we were able to more easily add a second row and format this in our to-do list view. That second row included a date, which we formatted using the dot formatted method. We also changed that line's dot foreground style by setting it to dot secondary. It gave it a nice gray look. And we learned to organize our code files in groups. Now up next, we're gonna tackle the tricky task of getting data displayed from our Swift data to be sorted according to various criteria and also to be limited, for example, only to show to-do items that we haven't completed. But until next time, stay Swifty, my friends.